It's been a terrible suffering for her. Not a day goes by that uh, Nancy doesn't uh, think of any. Every day she, um, she's waiting for a knock at the door or a telephone call to, uh, with some news that uh, of, of Annie. A young woman from New York was missing while in Ireland. It is believed she met a serial killer while hiking in the remote Wicklow Mountains. Today's case brings us to Ireland and to the county Wicklow. The final moments of Annie were likely in the town Enniskerry, a quaint town in Wicklow close to the Dublin Wicklow Mountains, a place we have covered before in the Justine Valdez case. She was a young woman who was abducted in Enniskerry and she was murdered a short while after. I'll put the video on screen now. Enniskerry is a very small and wonderful town and it offers fantastic forest walks best known for being the location of the Powers Court estate, set within some of the most stunning views Ireland has to offer. The Powers Court house was originally a 13th century castle and is now owned by the Slazinger family who came to wealth by starting a sporting goods company you may know. They produce tennis rackets and balls, which are still used at Wimbledon to this day. The story begins with Annie McCarrick, a Long Island, New York native, born on the 27th of March 1996, making her 26 when she disappeared. She was raised in Bayport, Long Island, New York, a town with wide, tidy streets with low walls and large detached houses. Annie spent 18 happy years of her life here. She was a confident, chatty girl and she was the only daughter to her parents, John and Nancy McCarrick, and they were both from New York. The couple had many happy years together, however when Annie disappeared, the relationship changed, and they ended up getting a divorce. They both remained living in Long Island, but at separate ends. Annie grew up with strong links to Ireland. Her grandmother on her mother's side had left Ireland a few decades previous, and she would tell Annie stories of the old country. So Annie would grow fond of the Irish and their culture, soon falling in love with the country and the people, spending many years travelling back and forward. Annie felt at home in Ireland, and she loved it so much she enrolled herself as a student here in the Maynooth College. She spent three years in Ireland, eventually moving back to the US in 1990 to further her studies. But a few years later Annie had the itch to move back over to Ireland. So after discussing with her parents, she would make the decision to move back over to Ireland. She wanted to see if she could settle down here. And she had her heart set on returning, and so she did. And in January 1993, she would kiss her rightful worrying parents goodbye and she stepped on board a plane in JFK airport on a one-way ticket to Dublin. Her parents were upset she was leaving and rightfully so. She was their only child and while they were all fond of Ireland, she was still moving away from her home country and she was alone. Annie would arrive back in Ireland in January of the year 1993 and she initially stayed with her friends Hilary and Philip Brady at an apartment in Dublin which was in the Clondalkin area. Annie had been in a relationship with Philip for a time but they remained friends and she grew very close to the Brady family. She grew very close with Philip's brother Hilary and his fiancée Rita and they would form a strong friendship. Annie eventually moved out and she moved into a shared apartment with two girls which was in the Sandy Mount area. She found a job working in a restaurant and she would soon switch jobs and she took a job in a cafe called Cafe Java which was on Leeson Street in the Dublin city area. And on March the 25th of Thursday, Annie finished her shift in the cafe and she would be due to work on the coming Saturday. And on Friday, Annie's two roommates were leaving the apartment for the weekend as they were set to return to their hometowns, leaving Annie alone for the weekend. But Annie made plans for her friend to come over on a Saturday and she also planned to meet an old college friend for drinks on a Sunday. So she would be kept busy. And when Friday came around, her two friends would leave the apartment as planned and from here Annie went to AIB and Sandymount, which is one of the main banks in Ireland. 
She was arranging for the transfer of her bank accounts from the Clondalkin branch when she first moved over to Ireland to her local one now in Sandymount. And she was seen here on CCTV footage and nothing was out of the ordinary. And from here she made her way to the Quinsworth supermarket which is now called Tesco and she picked up a few items. She had planned to make a dessert for her friends Hilary and Rita the next day. So she picked up some items for that. And when the receipt was later pulled, it was stamped with the time of 11.02am. And from here she made her way back to her apartment. But first she made two phone calls from a public kiosk phone. And the first phone call was to her friend Hilary. She was just confirming if they were both still on for the following evening. And they were. And the second phone call was to her friend Anne. And Annie was asking her if she wanted to join her in a hike in the village Enniskerry in County Wicklow. And Anne responded that she was injured and she couldn't. So Annie said that's no problem. She hung up the phone and then she made her way back to her apartment. She returned to her apartment at around 11.30. And time is unaccounted for from when she arrived home till around 3pm. When a plumber on a nearby apartment had seen Annie leave her apartment heading toward the number 18 bus stop on the New Grove Avenue. She would get the bus here to Renly, where she would get another bus, the number 44 to Enniskerry, County Wicklow. And at the number 44 bus stop, she was seen in the line getting on the bus by a former war colleague of hers. And she got onto the bus and went upstairs. And this was at around 3.40pm. And this would be the last confirmed positive sighting of any. The next Saturday, which was March the 27th, which was Annie's birthday, she was due to start her shift in work, but she would never arrive. Later that day, as planned, her friends Hilary and Rita showed up at her apartment at the agreed time of 8pm, and they were ready to celebrate her birthday. But there was no response at the door, and the apartment was in complete darkness, so they decided to ring her landline phone, but there was no answer. They waited around for a bit and then left, thinking she could have got caught up in work. But this isn't like Annie at all. She would have definitely let them know. When Sunday came around and Hilary and Rita still concerned by the lack of communication from Annie, they went to her workplace at the cafe and they learned Annie never showed up for work on Saturday. And she never showed up to collect her wages either. Shocked and surprised, they called Annie's flatmates. And they arrived back from their weekend away. And they said when they arrived home, the ingredients Annie had purchased were still left on the countertop. Learning this, they got in touch with Annie's mother Nancy in New York. She then travelled to Dublin on the first flight, and Hillary would pick her up from here. They then went straight to the Gardaí station to report Annie missing. John and his dad would soon follow Nancy over to Ireland and they didn't know it now but they would be staying in Ireland for the next two months. The Gardaí had a tough time piecing together what had happened to Annie. The fact that she was going about her normal routine it just made it that more difficult. There was no scream and no personal belongings found along the roadside. She had just disappeared. She wore a distinctive dark tweed jacket with oxblood coloured cowboy boots and she was carrying a tan shoulder bag when she left the apartment. When Gardy entered the second week of searching, they decided to circulate a photo to the television stations and newspapers in the hopes someone might have seen Annie. And from this, a man and a woman would come forward in two different locations. The woman who was working in the local post office said a woman matching Annie's description would come in and she said Annie bought three stamps for postcards and this would be very regular for Annie as she would like to keep in touch with friends and family back in the States so this could have very well been Annie. Unfortunately though, there was no CCTV footage for this so it was classed as an unconfirmed sighting and this would be the closest the Gardaí came to placing Annie in Enniskerry. And the man who would come forward, he was a bouncer at the Johnny Fox's pub, which is up in the Dublin mountains and it is the highest pub in Ireland and it is a very hot tourist spot. He said he seen an American woman matching Annie's description. She was entering a separate room where there was a traditional Irish music session starting. 
He said the woman didn't realise it was a £2 entry fee to the room. But as soon as he asked her for the fee, a man who was with her said, I've got this, and he paid for the two of them in. Annie was known to have gone to Johnny Fox's before, but this sighting could not be confirmed, and the bouncer said he doesn't remember seeing her for the remainder of the night. The pub is 3.5 miles from Enniskerry. By foot, it would have taken an hour and a half to cover the distance by the most direct route, which was a long and narrow country road. But if she really did go to Johnny Fox's that night, how did she intend to go home? There was no late night buses out that way. And taxis in the early 90s were very hard to come by. And this would be the last alleged sighting of Annie McCarrick. Following this sighting in the pub, the Gardaí had now a description of the man that was with Annie. He was described as being in his mid-twenties, clean shaven of average build, with dark brown hair. The Gardaí had made many appeals for information, but neither the woman or the man seen that night have ever come forward. It is very unusual for two people to not come forward, which makes detectives believe this might have in fact been Annie, and the person with her that night could have been responsible for her disappearance. But they had no evidence at all to link anyone to the case. The McCarrick family were devastated to learn their daughter had been missing, and no evidence was found. They didn't believe anything like this could happen in Ireland, and they were shocked to learn two young women named Antoinette Smith and Patricia Doherty had been murdered in 1987 and 1991. Their bodies have been found, but unfortunately, their cases remain unsolved. And the monsters, or monster who murdered them, still walks the streets of Ireland to this day. If you look at the similarities of the two cases, both women were strangled and their bodies were buried in close proximity to the Dublin Mountains. So it could have been very likely that there was a serial killer active around the area at the time. Annie was the first of eight women of similar ages who went missing in Ireland in the mid to late 90s. While the women are linked to a probable serial killer active in Ireland at the time, I believe only a few of the women actually are, and Annie McCarrick is one of these. As the investigation went on, the Gardaí began getting less calls and the case went cold. And Nancy and her husband returned to New York in May 1993, and without their only daughter, Annie. Nancy said, and I quote, it was so hard for me to leave Ireland without Annie, but I just had to. There was no news, nothing. We knew early on that Annie had been murdered, but you always wonder if she will return, especially when the holidays come around, or her birthday. The pain never ends, end quote. Not one person has been arrested for Annie McCarrick's disappearance and probable murder. There was never any prime suspects, a number of men have been interviewed, but no one was ever detained for question. In 1996, Gardy thought they had a breakthrough when a young woman was attacked and murdered in Dublin. When detectives looked into who the young woman was with before she was murdered, a man who also knew Annie was with her that night. But it turned out it was a total coincidence, and a different man was arrested for her murder. There was no further tips on the case until June 1997 when information was given to a detective that around the time of Annie's disappearance, there was suspicious activity in the area. This would lead the Gardaí to begin a search in a pet cemetery near Enniskerry. There was a tip that a large box had been buried around the time of Annie's disappearance, and this led 20 Gardaí to search the cemetery. They completed the search in one day finding nothing, and being no closer to finding Annie. Unfortunately, in 2009, Annie's father John passed away, not knowing the truth of what happened to his daughter. As of March 2023, 30 years after Annie first disappeared, the Gardaí have confirmed her disappearance is now being treated as a murder investigation, and they will take a fresh look at all of the evidence they have on file. of the information available to the investigation team at Irishtown Garda Station today, Friday the 24th of March 2023, I can confirm that this missing person investigation has now been upgraded to a murder investigation. This morning I am making a public appeal for information. 
I want to speak to any person who met, spoke with, or had any interaction with Annie McCarrick on the 26th of March 1993 or subsequently. There is a person or persons who have information on the disappearance of Annie McCarrick and her murder on or about the 26th of March 1993 who haven't yet spoken to Gardaí or who may have spoken to us already but are not in a position or were not in a position to tell us everything at the time uh, that they spoke with us. I want to speak with any person who has any information on the large brown satchel type handbag which is believed that Annie was in possession of when she went missing. I'm appealing to those persons 30 years later, please come forward and speak to the investigation team. Anyone with information in relation to the disappearance of Annie McCarrick is encouraged to please come forward to either the investigation team at Irish Town Garda Station at 01 666 9600 or your local Garda Station or the local Garda Confidential Telephone Line at 1-800-666-111. And that's it for this case. Annie McCarrick's disappearance is a case that has haunted Ireland for over 30 years now. Despite extensive searches and investigations, there's been no sign of Annie, and her family are still searching for answers. Hopefully the fresh news on the case will give Nancy some hope for future leads on the disappearance of her daughter. Her case still remains open, and Gardy will continue to investigate any new leads. Annie's family has been touched by the outpouring of support and kindness from people all over the world. And despite her daughter going missing in Ireland, she still holds a soft spot for the place and the people. They hope one day they can find Annie's remains and give her the burial she deserves. Thoughts go out to the McCarrick family. Thank you for watching and I will see you in the next one.